Hi, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Patrick Gomez. I'm a staff writer at People Magazine, um, but let me get to the people you actually are here to see. Um, please welcome uh, the co-creators and stars of Another Period, uh, Natasha Legero and Ricky Lindholm. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, guys. <laughs> What's up? Um, so I know we've got some really big fans in the audience, uh, and they got to just watch uh, Roosevelt, I believe is the title. So they've already seen it, probably. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I'd love to, we're going to talk about the whole project as a whole, but it, just because that's fresh in everyone's mind, talk to us a little bit about what goes into deciding what the central characters of an episode are going to be, and, and specifically this episode, I know you guys were saying, you can recall specific moments. What about this one do you feel like was made this particular episode special, as I'm sure each one of them for you is? Well, I feel like we always want to do things that are slightly historically accurate. And when we realized Roosevelt did not have a vice president, we're like, okay, well, it could have been Frederick. Like if there was someone in there, we're like, we can't go there. But the fact that there wasn't one, we're like, what would that be like? And how would he get there? And the fact that senators were not voted for, they were just appointed by their fathers, basically. We're like, they could probably get there from there, right? If you're can be appointed senator, you can be appointed vice president. And we're like, how could that happen? And that's where it started. Fantastic. Well, let's go back to the beginning. Talk to me about how this project came to be, because I know it was, it was, you had to do the short film and there was a whole process to get to where it ended up. So to talk to us a little bit about kind of from conception to inception to getting it on the air. Well, I think, it, yeah, it was definitely, I forget how long it was, but it took like a very long time, like from the time we made the short and then we just, you know, we didn't, we so, kind of sold it and then they took it back and they decided they weren't, this other network wasn't going to buy it. And then we got a new producer and then we changed the pitch and then we went out again. And I think we re edited the sizzle maybe. And then finally comedy central was like, even though they had passed before, they were like, okay, we'll take it now. Uh, and so then when they took it, then we got a pilot. So then we had to do, and that was like a year and a half in, and then they do the pilot and then I think we waited almost a year to be picked. So we were much younger in the pilot, if yeah. you watch. <laughs> it is crazy. It does. It, it makes me have less sympathy when someone's like, I spent weeks working on a pitch and they didn't buy my series. I'm like, <laughs> OK. I'm like, we like spent so much of our own money making this short, you know, pitched it to every network. Everyone said no. And we said, well, why? And everyone had the same feedback, which is that we don't see where it goes. And so then we're like, okay, well then where does it go? And we spent like six months, we wrote the pilot on spec and really wrote it. We wrote draft after draft after draft. It's what you saw in the show. We wrote the pilot. We wrote a Bible that was like 40 pages long of each character and where they go throughout the series, everybody. And when we pitched it, and then, then we went to our agents, we're like, we're ready to pitch it again. And they're like, that's not how it works, they passed. And we were like, that can't be over because we have, they had this feedback and they were like, they're just being nice, it's whatever. And then. Natasha had this general with Debbie Liebling at Red Hour, and we basically ambush pitched her. She's like, why don't you come with me? And we were like, here's our, and we just did the pitch, and she's like, okay, I want to make it. And we went, she's the one who got us back out to the networks, because she, you know, she was like a head person at Comedy Central for a long time, and so people trust her. So she got us back out, and by the time we were pitching it, we redid the, the sizzle, by the time we were, the first one was like 14 minutes, the second one was like five, so it was more snappy. And by the second time, we were so ready that when they had any question, they'd be like, well, this Blanche, we're like, well, Blanche is a princess. And both of us had every single thing about their past. And, and it was, we were just so ready that they were like, fine. And in general, I think we applied that to like get, like when we wanted to get Christina Hendricks, like we had a lunch with her and made her a booklet of like, you know, pictures of people who were inspired who we, who we were inspired by for her character of Chair, and you know we could really tell her so much about the character and what's gonna happen in every episode and what's the emotional arcs, and I think in general, that's just a good, more, the more information, the better that you can give people. And you can't really quantify, like are things harder for women and minorities? Like, I don't know, but like, just in case, you have to be like, the as good as the highest person who's well, pitching somewhere else you can't be as good as the basic person like just in case like be the best person and i, I think. think we've learned that too as actresses watching um 
people audition because, you know, someone comes in and I think I've definitely come into auditions and been like, whatever, I'll read it, you know, but you have to realize you're competing against people who take this so fucking seriously, who are going to be completely memorized, completely off book. They are ready to blow everybody out of the water. And so it's like you even if you're more right for the part, you can't really compete with these people. So it's like you. And so I've actually started to not go on auditions if I don't have the time to. to like really kill it, you know, because that is I mean, it's just it's just about excellence, people. <laughs> just be perfect. Just be perfect. Uh, what about the, so did this come from did you two just want to work on a project and you threw around ideas or did the idea come first? Like how did how did the actual like idea of what another period became come from? Well, Ricky and I went to Africa together to help malaria. What did we do? Malaria no more. <laughs> Very important Help cause. stop it's malaria. A, um, no, it's a pretty crazy organization and they're actually stopping it, which yeah, is insane. Yeah, it's amazing. When a charity actually works, you're just like, holy shit. But Unfortunately, they wanted us to make comedy videos there and that was a little difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so we were, we had a lot of time. We were there for like, I think 10 days and in, in Western Africa and some of those days we were waiting for the other people to come like it was us with like um, Ed Helms and Paul Shear and Nick Kroll and they but they like got stuck in Paris so Ricky and I were like <laughs> is stuck in Senegal <laughs> just kind of like with this director who was like there's Slave Island can we do a comedy sketch there Natasha and I were like no <laughs> and then they're like okay here's where AIDS was discovered and we're like no like, what about we just this do we just refuse to do anything what about this where they still have leprosy and it was just like very oh. challenging <laughs> so then we were like we should really try to do something that we think is funny and not that you know it, not because of that but you know we spent a lot of time together and we kind of both realized that if you looked at our IMDb's you know we I have like maybe 70 things on my IMDb. I'm sure you have a similar amount. And I was like, I think three of them are funny that I think are funny. So like what we, we must have to create our own content. And so we started getting together after Africa and, you know, pitching ideas around. And we had this idea. Um, we just had a bunch of ideas and then we kind of landed. Um, I had this idea that I, I had two ideas that I pitched to her. One took place in 1902, but it was like, more of a serious thing, but I was like, it'd be so cool to be in 1902. And then I was pitching her this fake reality show about these idiots living in LA. But I was like, but I, I've had this idea for three years. It might be like, I don't know if it's been done before. And she was like, well, why don't we combine those ideas? And so then we just started working it out. And it just kind of like, I mean, we were probably drunk too, but it did make a lot of sense. Well, we <laughs> you know, sometimes that's when the best ideas happen. <laughs> so then we just sort of, you know, started thinking about it and then we'd go away. Like we write really well. If we go away, you know, we'll go to Ojai and just kind of spend a weekend there and come up with all the details. It's just nice. It, it's hard to focus, I find, in town. And so if you can just like go away, it doesn't have to be an expensive place, but just where it's like you wake up, you're, you're pitching, you're brainstorming, you know, and we, we just wake up, we get some coffee, take a walk and then work. And then we have lunch and it's fine. And then we work. And then we get a glass of wine and we talk about our work and what we're going to do the next day. And then we have the rest of the night off. And then we sit in a hot tub and we drink wine. It's great. And the next day we wake up, we work. And it's so much easier when you don't, you can't like clean your counter. You can't run and grab something. You're, you're not running late because you're sitting in the same hotel room. You yeah. just, it's so much easier. And so we really would get together and, and then you look forward to it because you're like in a nice place away from LA and there's a hot tub. And so, so, so we would do that a lot. And then I think we got, you know, we would, I think we sat there for like four hours by the pool trying to think of the right name for the butler. <laughs> we landed on Mr. Peepers. Like we almost fell off our chairs. We're like, that's it. Yeah, it was, it was. And it also really yeah. helped to imagine, like what, I think first we imagined Michael Ian Black because then when, when you imagine him, then it's like, well, what would, it just, the character came to life. So that was something we really started doing was like, who's our dream person for these characters. But then like what, something really crazy happened, which is we got all the people <laughs> that we used as our inspirations. So that was really lucky, I guess. Yeah, Comedy Central's like, how are you going to get this cast? And we're like, I don't know. And they're like, it was kind of cast contingent. They're like, we'll pick it up, but like, let's see if you, we felt that precariousness of like, can you get the cast? And when they all said, Let, yes, Comedy Central was like, okay. And then we got Christina Hendricks and they were like, okay, <laughs> like, keep going, ladies. Well, 
I think too, like actors want to be in a period piece because like maybe there's more. I don't know of a lot of period comedies right now. I mean, besides the Goldbergs, like there's not a lot of period com. Like there's a lot of period stuff right Scares now. Me that that's a period. Well, I mean, <laughs> but yes, it is. But you know, we. I think it attracts actors because they get to like dress up and act. You know, the men get to act gay for a day and they love it and. We would also like write so specifically for them. We're like, okay, we really want Brett Gelman and we'd watch videos of Brett Gelman and we're like, what's the funniest thing about Brett? Like what's, when he reads this, like we want him to be like, yes, I'll do this for scale. <laughs> you know, we, so, and we know he's very busy and in demand and so it has to be funny. Well, and talk to me a little bit about that because you mentioned you have all these things that you not um, you have seventy on your IMDb page, but I'm sure there's thousands that it you might be ninety. <laughs> it's thousands though that you've auditioned for, and these are things one that you haven't written that two you might not think are funny. How important was it for you guys to have that control and be like, look, we're we're writing something that I want to be a part of versus I'm on this audition that like I don't really care about the project. Well, for me, it's completely changed the way I feel about auditioning. And Natasha was talking about this earlier, but it was, and the same thing happened when we, when we did the Garfunkel and Ocho on IFC and Kate and I were talking about it after like seeing auditions and, and she, she said to me, she goes, how dare I walk into a room and not be prepared? And I was like, yeah, cause you spend, it's like outlines and notes and notes and producers notes and network notes to get to that line. And it's like a negotiation. And to, to make that scene is like so much of your lifeblood that when someone's like, Oh, whatever, like, it's just like not good enough. And so now my philosophy is like, if I have time to crush it, or like, is, well, you know, you never know. Like sometimes you suck and it just happens. Like it happens. But like, if I feel like I have time to, to really go in there and do it, then I'll do it. And if I don't have time, I say, no, I don't walk in there half-assed anymore. So, yeah. I wish my dad was a famous director. <laughs> I'm just going to let that one. Stuff. <laughs> I have to work so hard. <laughs> um, you, you were talking about the writing process, and obviously you two had spent a lot of time together. Uh, that had to make playing sisters easier. But what, did it, what do you feel like was the key to writing a sister relationship? Because obviously friends are very different than that. So what was the key to mastering this relationship, both from the writing side and the acting side? I, mean, I think it was the Senegal video. Yeah, I think Ricky and I, like, you know, we're very different, and the way we approach things is very different. You know, I'm, you know, I, I'm a little more, how would you say it, like, do, dom, domineering, or I, well, I guess I would be a little more high status, even though you're high stat, like, I'm more in charge. You know, there's a, and, and not that she's a sidekick, but she's just a little, she's the stupid one. So I'm the one with the idea. And she's the enabler to the idea. Only the characters, right? Of course. <laughs> no, but when we did this, so we did, we went to Senegal and couldn't make anything there. So when we got back, they're like, you still have to make a video. <laughs> I forgot about that. And so we were like, We were like oh. in a theater, like at a, like Acme or something. Yeah, we were in, yeah, it was just a black box theater. And they're like, we have a camera, write something. And so we were like, uh, and so we played these spoiled women who went to Africa hoping to meet Sean Penn or like to be part of a cause in order to like help our acting careers. And then, you know, so that was the things, that was the parts we played. And then it was sort of that dynamic that we kept going with. And because we are very different, it makes a good mix on camera because, you know, you don't want two people who are both idiots and you don't want two people who are both fucking bitches. You know what I mean? Like, sorry, that's what my husband always says. <laughs> Character's a fucking bitch. Um, so now you've gotten to tell this this story uh, entering into a third season. I know you guys are not in shooting season three yet, but you get, they're, they're very far into writing season three. What is it? So obviously it's a marathon to get through a season and then it ends. Is it a thing where you're jumping to get in the writer's room again? Or are you excited for the break? Do you need the break to come back fresh? Talk to me, talk to me about like what it's like to finish the season and then... I don't think we had a break ever, did we? <laughs> Because we're in the editing bay, and then we're writing, and then we're shooting. It's like, you know that, that business paradigm of like, you know, there's like the, the triangle where it's like you can have something fast, good, and there's fast, good, and cheap, and you can have two. I feel like we're good and cheap, so it takes forever. It takes all year. It just does. Like, we write all the episodes at once. We film all the episodes at once. We edit. There's no overlap, and it's just like, you can't, you can't, you can have two. So we have to. You can have fast and good. Mm -hmm. You can have cheap and fast. Mm -hmm. So you can have <laughs> so you can have like good and cheap but not fast. 
You can have fast and cheap, but not good. And you can have good and, wait, so you can have, oh, you can have cheap and fast, but not good, right? Well, yeah. you guys get it. You guys understand how three things work, yeah. It's a fun paradigm. What surprised you most about where the story has gone compared to like when you first wrote the pilot? What surprised us about it? Or has it? it? Or was it so well planned out that even in I mean, even we're in, in charge three, of what it is. So like nothing really surprises us because we decide. You mean do, like where we'll, we'll allow it to go? Or do you, Oh, yeah. I, I, have an, I, have an, I have a thought for that. And I think you would agree that I think the Ricky and I, when we started, did not think shit humor was funny at all. And now we, you know, have diarrhea off a hot air balloon. And I don't know, like something about... <laughs> Being a comedian, you kind of eventually just have to give in and be like, okay, farts are funny. Um, and being the writers, but also actors in the show, how much is there, are there particular actors that you feel like have changed the roles from what you kind of, even though you did such a good job researching them beforehand that you're like, oh, now that I see you playing it, we're taking it in a different direction or that we're doing something different with the character? God, I would say, I would say all of them. Because in our first short that we wrote, um, Armin Weitzman, who plays Garfield, he was like a buddy of mine who would kind of like, he kind of lived nearby. He was our buddy. And he was just kind of like, he's kind of always free. So he was like lived in the neighborhoods where like, will you come over and do one line? Like that kind of thing. It was like, and then um, Beth Dover, who plays Blanche, we asked her because her husband was originally in the short, Joe Latrulio. And we're like, oh, let's ask. Cause but we that also was one thought line. she was really talented. Yes. But then we didn't know that they were going to bring so much to these like two line parts. Like they brought these, like we were like, that's a whole kit. Like Armin, like being like telegram. He had a whole thing. We're like, what is that? And then Beth was like, excuse me. When she's like introducing the orphans in this short, like they had the smallest parts and we're like, well, you just made those for us. Cause they weren't like, that was not our writing. Like telegram lady was not a great line. And these people <laughs> showed up. Yeah. We knew they were talented, but they showed up and like gave us characters as gifts. And we're like, okay, I guess we're telegram lady. Yeah. But then Armin was so funny. We're like, well, thank you for that. We don't have to do that work. I love it. Um, well, obviously you don't want to give a lot of things away, but what can you tease to the super fans in the audience about season three, since you ha are, you know, so far in the writing process? I don't know what, what how do you tease something without t giving it away? Well, I know. Well, here's one thing. Um, so, you know, Frederick is a high political figure and politics have changed a lot recently. So there might be a lot of comparisons there <laughs> that could, that our, our season changed a lot uh, in November. So there's that. Our writer's room became very depressing for two weeks. <laughs> just two weeks? <laughs> well, the first two weeks, then we just banned talk about it, so. Um, what part of the process is most, do you find most fulfilling or interesting because you're involved in so much of it as co-creators and stars and writers and producers? I think for me, like, and I just feel like the acting is the easiest part. So that's maybe the most fun for me because I probably wouldn't do the other stuff if I didn't have to. <laughs> but I think also the editing process and the producing, it was fun to find out that I was able to do it and be good at it. I think especially producing for women, maybe is, it's easy. I don't know. I just feel like our minds can go so fast. We can multitask and do so many things. We're such natural producers that like sometimes we'll, we'll be working with men or directors. And it's like, I feel like I can send like, I can be very efficient while I'm doing like four things. And I think that's one of the best things about being a producer or one of the best qualities that you need to have. How about for you? Um, what was the exact question is what was my favorite part? Yeah, well, like, what, what do you find most fulfilling or interesting about the process that you go through when you're working on this show? The publicity is the most yes, fulfilling. Yes, the Today Show. Um, I think it's like realizing that you can do it because you think it's so, I didn't know what a showrunner was and it feels so impossible. It feels so like, how did that person get there? And then you're kind of like, oh, it's just the person who kind of has the last say and stuff and you have to have this conviction of your vision and you have to be like, flexible and take notes but also be like no peepers wouldn't do that you have to be like someone has to know and you have to be like okay with just being like nope that would not happen and you have to like care about it so much but then also be able to take input or like give up sa sacrifice things without changing the essential um, kernel of what you want to say and then, like figuring out that you can do that and that you can lead a group of people and that you can sort of it sucks having to like I didn't want to learn to edit I didn't want to you know but it, like but then you're like no I it's just if it's important enough you just learn how to do all of it and do you feel like it's made you guys 
better actresses when you're working on other projects now, knowing and experiencing all that side? Or is it harder because you want to have It definitely doesn't make you a better actress. No, it's worse. It actually makes you a worse actress yeah. in your own show because you're like looking at the monitor trying to deal with like, why does that child, why is that hat like that? Or why, you know what I mean? Like, because the thing that your friend said, Ricky told me this thing that her friend who's a director said, whereas like the showrunner, you're the person who looks in the monitor and you kind of know what's wrong. Like, you, you know the thing that nobody else knows. You know, it's like the makeup girls looking at the makeup and the director might be looking at, you know, how things are looking. And I think that, you know, we're, we can look at the monitor and, you know, we'll see the thing that like n nobody else is going to catch. So it's that is fulfilling knowing that you can like make it better. Just but acting wise, I don't feel like a better actor. I actually feel that like um, I feel like that lack of it because you spend eight weeks of the year shooting and the rest of the time creating and like meeting with editors and, and hiring a post-production supervisor that you sort of like aren't and then and then these great actors come in someone like Jason Ritter who just did a Broadway play and like six shows and he comes in and you see that just that he's just been he's just warmed up and ready and I'm like oh I do miss that part so I feel like I feel like when we go on hiatus next, I need to go to acting class. Like I need to like go back to like figure out like how to do stuff again. But the good thing about having your own show is like you are acting, but you're acting things that you've chosen and you've chosen the best possible thing to play that's going to suit your talents and your strengths. So in a way, I wouldn't want to go back to not doing that because then that's you just, true. unless you have geniuses writing you stuff, which happens for some people, you know. But didn't really happen for us that much. <laughs> um, this being a, a SAG after event, I, I'd love to go back to the beginning of your career. How did you guys get your SAG or your after cards? Um, I got my SAG card. So I was sort of depressed in college <laughs> and I knew I wanted to be an actor, but my high school didn't have drama. Like I just like, I didn't know if I could do it. Like I didn't, you know, and so after college, I just felt like, like this is like the Olympics of acting. This is like the big leagues. And I was like, I don't feel ready. I feel like just depressed and not, I just don't feel like I'm there. And so I moved to San Francisco for a year just to sort of like get on meds, talk and talk therapy, like get a little bit of money, whatever. And then um, I got a job as a PA on um, Nash Bridges. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I was peeing, but I was always like, I was just so unashamed. I'm like, I want to be an actress. I want to move to LA and be an actress, which now like you, you don't kind of do that, but like you have to do that at the beginning because people don't, wouldn't know otherwise. You have to be like unembarrassed. And I was like, can I be an extra? Can I get a Taft Hartley? And I got two Taft Hartleys and I was going to wait to get a third one. And then I'm like, no, fuck it. I was ready to move. And so um, the, the, I just randomly met this person and this is like the boldness of living here. I just moved here and randomly met this man and I was like, you work at Adam, Adam Sandler's company? Can I get a Taft Hartley? <laughs> I was like, I need to be in SAG. And he was like, I, yeah, I think I can do that. And then I did. And then he, he got you that? He got me a day of, a day of an extra work on Master of Disguise, uh, that Dana Carvey movie. And then I was in SAG. So I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I do not remember the, the I don't remember the the shows but I do do remember getting being an extra three times maybe more and just like being pretty humiliated by the experience too because people treated you differently and I remember like the lead guy in this commercial or maybe it was like a pilot he was just like coming on to me and he was like so what, what are you here to you know we were talking he's like so what are you playing today and I was like oh I'm I'm an extra and he was like Oh, and then he just like walked away. Like it was just like, it, and I was just like, is this what it's going to be like? It seems so humiliating. But that seemed to be the easiest way to be an extra, or right? To get your SAG card. I mean, how did Ashton Kutcher do it? He just auditioned and got a big show and then you never had to do that? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm just wondering like, how do people do it without getting taft heart lead I, guess. I mean yeah i mean i know i've heard of stories of people that you go in and you audition for a big project and you just happen to get it and so then they they do basically taft hartley you in that move to right so we wanted to get in sag to do what then be able to audition is that what you i didn't know what i was doing <laughs> i just had heard of sag and i knew that was like the thing to be in and i'd heard of agents like i hadn't i had no 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 idea what i was doing but i was like i knew that there were some good things that i was going toward <laughs> I, I lived in New York too for like five years before I came here and I would tell Ricky the stories of like I would work at a, as a cocktail waitress and I remember this woman who was in a, 
uh, soap opera came in once that I'd remembered. I had remembered the soap opera from my high school, and I like came to her and I like got on my knees and I was like, "Can you please get me in your soap opera? What do I have to do? Can I please get you a headshot?" Like I had no idea how it worked. I just thought you were supposed to like beg people to like. That's how most people get jobs, right? <laughs> It was pretty sad. Because you hear those misleading, stupid stories about like one person who's like bold enough to ask and then they, you're like... <laughs> but hey, you were bold enough to ask. You know, what? Your third Taft-Hartley. Yes, <laughs> but I was bold enough to ask for an ex- a Taft-Hartley, you know, I, yeah. I, I guess, yeah, never mind. I actually take it back because you're absolutely right. You're right. It's very hard when you don't have like guidance and you have to figure it all out on your own. Like I remember for like five years I walked around New York like, I just want a mid-size agent. And it's like, why did I care if it was a mid-size agent? Like, what I want is a job. Like, why do I, you know, but you just get so confused. And so, like, you don't know what you want. You just want to be, you know, doing it. And so the agent would send you on jobs. But really, you could skip that step and just get the job. There you go. Um, Well, I'm going to be integrating some of your questions. I have them here. Um, Thank you guys for submitting them. Um, Amy Warren wanted to know, uh, how did you break into comedy acting? So was comedy something that you were always had an affinity for? Or was that something that you kind of found yourself going towards at a certain point? Well, I when I moved to L.A., I remember going to auditions and like these actors and everyone was kind of like, what, you know, like people were kind of snotty and you'd be in these waiting rooms and it's like, oh, did you get adjustments? I got adjustments. Or like people would, you know, like the director talked to them and everyone's always bragging and I was, you know, just feeling this vi- these vibes and then I remember one time I like got sent on this comedy audition it was like, everyone's laughing, people are doing bits in there and I was like, whoa, this is like the energy of where I want to be, you know? And, you know, I, I feel like I've always even in class, like people would laugh when I talked, even though I'm was I'm like, wait, I wasn't trying to be funny, you know? So it's like, you just kind of have to have that energy that you are having a connection with a crowd. And then I got into stand up. so. And how about you? Mine was sort of, I, I got very inconsistent feedback when I started and I was kind of booking like half comedy, half drama, but very small parts, but it, nothing was, I was always like, the funny friend and then I was like it, but it was it was just such a I, I never knew what my niche was you can imagine this as me like you know I don't know what to cast me and like I do not know I just don't have that obviousness and then I kind of realized um that in drama I didn't really have that much of a place like I don't quite look like those girls on CW shows but I don't quite look like these serious British act like it just didn't quite was, I was not, I was, I was circling these things and I was testing for things and I wasn't getting them. And then with comedy, all of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, you're allowed to kind of look, you don't have to be 100% you're like, I am perfect. so hot in this, well, t- yeah, in this You pool. don't have to be perfect <laughs> as long as you're funny. They're not as critical about everything. Like you don't have to be this cookie cutter thing if you can tell a joke and you can get a job e- more easily. And I felt like that's just where I started getting jobs. And so I was like, well, I'll keep working on this. Uh, as part of Amy's question, was there something you kind of learned? Was it, you know, not being too self-conscious? Or what did you kind of learn as you went down that road? Was there was there an aha moment in the sense of like, oh, I feel more comfortable doing this now than maybe I did my first comedy audition or my first stand-up? More comfortable doing comedy? Like what, 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 what advice, basically the question for her was what advice do you have? Like, like for somebody that's aspiring to do that kind of thing, is there, is there a lesson you feel like you learned or a particular thing that you think made it easier for you to, to start doing comedy? I mean, I don't want to tell everyone to go do stand up cause that's like a hard road, but you know, I feel like for me personally that really helped and then really sticking to sticking with it. I think it's all about finding clues too. Like you do stand up and then you sort of get these clues. You see what people laugh at and you're like, oh, that was some, something there. Or you're doing improv or you're in an acting class or you're in an audition and you get these little nibbles and you're like, often it's okay. the thing that you didn't know. Like the, I had a friend, I think Bonnie McFarlane told me this, like who's a comedian. She was like, pay attention to what people are laughing at, you know, like it's not always the thing that you think it like you'll write a joke and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, and everyone laughs or, you know, so you're like, oh, okay, that maybe this uh, higher, you know, status persona, there's something to that. So why don't I try to write jokes within that? And, you know, and then for me too, I was like, maybe if I wear an evening dress on stage, I can be meaner. And so people won't be as offended. I'm not dressed like some, you know, asshole hipster. So I don't know, just like, yeah, just, and then trying it and it works and then you just keep doing it and you hone it and you experiment. Great. Well, and this goes right into uh, Amber uh, Rivette. Yeah, Uh, she's right there. 
<laughs> um, Hi, Amber. <laughs> um, and uh, she was wondering, uh, you know, what what do you feel like is is I think you kind of answered this already of what's your most what's most important tip in terms of doing stand up? Uh, but uh, she wants to know how it also transitioned into your work that you've done on camera and does stand up? Yeah, does does things you've learned by doing stand up transition onto your on camera work? Um, what do you think? God, I don't know. That's a really good question because I honestly don't know. I. In some ways, I feel like it's this constant back and forth, at least for me, because there's like times when I'm more confident and there's times when I'm less confident and there's times when I'm like, oh, I'm in this groove and I feel like funny and like kind of alive. And then there's times where I'm like, nothing I'm doing is good and I can feel it. It just is like this back and forth. And yeah, I guess sometimes it informs it. And then sometimes I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. So, but I think in an overarching thing, like I've been doing it 16 years. So in the 16 years, it's definitely informed it. But as far as like a year to year or month to month, I'm like, I don't know. But it does it help to be surrounded by all of the comedians in our show. Like, I think that that helps. Like, you know, just being, I remember I did Reno 911 with Tom Lennon. That was like one of my first jobs. And like, I didn't know anything about improv. And I left that, that night, like we did it at night. And I was just like, I am an amazing improviser. Just because he was so good. He just made me so good. And then, you know, just like, you know, I, I remember I asked him, I was like this girl who didn't have pants on and I was like, you know, he was arresting me and I was like, can I have a cigarette? And he was like, okay. And he like stopped and tried to find his cigarettes. Like just that idea of saying yes is like, so you learn so much. Cause like if you're arresting someone, why would you let, why would you give them a cigarette? But like, he just said yes to the moment. And then it made my part really funny. And all I had to do was just like ask him for something. So it's really great working with those like super pros. Um, and uh, Jack Scollard, I hope I'm saying that name right. Yeah, there you go. Now we know who you are, <laughs> if we hate this question. <laughs> um, he wants to know actually how does improvisation play into another period, or does it? Not that much for us. Like some people, like someone like Thomas Lennon is born to improvise in 1902 dialect, <laughs> but, but the show shoots very quickly, and it's hard to do it without slipping into going like, you know, and it's hard to do it and not use the contraction. So not, not that much to be honest. Yeah. We, we just let, you know, Tom, Brian Husky, Mike Liam Black can do it yeah. too. But in general, but he usually chooses not to like he does sometimes, but he likes to kind of, and we put a lot of energy into like making sure the scripts are punched up. And so we have, you know, I think we've learned from friends who've had shows like, you're like, well, just figure it out on the day. Everyone's really funny. And then like that never really happens. You know, I think people's projects suffer if you don't have, you should l really love, I think what, there was a few scenes we had to rewrite on, the, on set, which can be challenging. But in general, I think we try to really like everything that's there. Yeah. Well, and you wrote it, so... <laughs> Um, so Will has a question of if you guys have ever butted heads during production, how do you guys get past a, maybe a dis creative disagreement or a decision that maybe you don't think a line is funny or, or how do you give each other criticism in terms of being actors and co being co-actors, but also being producers and writers? We don't really criticize each other for acting like, you know, that's kind of Jeremy's, th you know, he's directing, he's behind the camera. I, I can't imagine a scenario where I would really say anything to another actor. Like, that's just, we just trust Jeremy and our performers. And like, if we need an adjustment, he'll give it to us. But I think as far as jokes go, it's kind of who's ever more passionate about that particular line wins, I would say. Yeah, and it's nice to have Jeremy there as a tiebreaker because if they both think, even in the writing process, if they both think something's hilarious and, you know, I hate it, I'll kind of be like, well, if they both like it, then, you know, there's there's very few things that I'll fight for if like two people are saying no and vice versa. I think we're good at doing Good to that. have odd numbers. And we agree on most things, you know, it's just like sometimes there'll be little details that. It's a creative process. <laughs> um, and uh, to uh, close it out, because unfortunately we do have to wrap it up, but um, uh, Ricky's spelled R-I-C-K-Y, so. A little different. Um, <laughs> um, I wanted to know um, if you guys have a go-to creative comedy or something that you go to to watch if you feel like you need inspiration or that you feel like inspires you in the writing room or the acting. 
I've been watching this um, PBS Edwardian house, which is this reality show. And there's like so many of them. And sometimes I'll, they're kind of boring, but sometimes I'll watch those. I love watching Upstairs, Downstairs. I'll pretty much turn on anything that takes place 100 years ago. And, you know, and then my husband gets home and we have to watch Everest or whatever he turned on last night. Like he's always watching like these action. Like, you know, it's just, it's just nice to, to watch these Things where people, you know, you just get ideas, you get inspired, you know, I don't know, what do you watch? Um, Veep really inspires me and The Comeback really inspires me and Kimmy Schmidt, these things that have like so many jokes per page, mm -hmm. the, the, the just the, in, in 30 Rock, these things, and, and also things like The Office where it's like a joke you wouldn't see coming, like kind of just like studying those. And then also um, I listen to Hamilton a lot. <laughs> I know a lot of people are, <laughs> but it really does. Like I, it's just so good that I'm just like, it makes me want to be Lin-Manuel. Like I listen to it and I'm like, this must have like, like he just dug in so hard and he gave so much of himself in every single line. And I'm like, it just inspires me. I don't know. And I agree too. It, it's so good watching Kimmy Schmidt and 30 Rock because like they'll have a three sentence scene and like every line's funny. And it's like, and, and we only have 21 minutes. So it is fun to like figure out how can you say the most in these like super short scenes and still make it really funny. Um, well, I know you don't have a premiere date, but for everyone that maybe doesn't watch it on Comedy Central, let them know where they can watch it and, and when hopefully they can expect to see more. You can buy it on iTunes. I think that's just, I think that's it right now. Um, we were on Hulu. Maybe we'll be back again. We don't actually know exactly how that contract works, but ComedyCentral.com, iTunes. Ricky, do you know anyone at Hulu? We could beg them. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have to know someone at Viacom because that's who did the deal with Hulu, but yeah. Right, okay. No, good. Well, thank you guys. We, I'm sure everyone here is very grateful that season three is Thanks for coming. Almost yeah, thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Thank you guys, and thank you, first of all. Cool, thank, thank you. you.